It's with great pleasure that we introduce our first speaker. Um, it, this is Mishi, Mishi Chowdhury. She works in both New York and in New Delhi. She's a technology lawyer. So over to you, Mishi. Well, a very good morning. And I can't see anything, <laughs> which is perhaps good. So um, I get paid to rain on many people's parade. I am a lawyer. I also get paid to help free and open source software developers um, in their legal work. This is just balancing the karma equation. Uh, what you do as a lawyer, you need to redeem yourself, so that's what I do. Uh, when I talk about my work as a lawyer, the response is usually a snooze fest, or it's inquiries about the hourly rate or the total damage that I'm going to cost. If lawyers are in the audience, then there is polite, covert, scrambling to poach clients. That's much easier to deal with. It's when people ask me to talk about my work as an activist that I begin to weigh my words a little more carefully. Not because that there's going to be an hourly rate or any billables, which are far more attractive economically. But now, I have just issued an invitation to be called a traitor. Someone who should be booked under sedition, unpatriotic, showing the country in a bad light, challenging the ever power technology, a Luddite an anti-innovation person indulging in fake news. A particularly classy tweet, which was hurled at someone I once worked with, said, you need to be put in a burqa, raped, and dragged around Saudi Arabia. Very classy, keep it up. But what the what? Let's talk about a larger question today to feed the hunger of the trolls worldwide. Now, um, if you can see, that's the title of my talk. Whatever happened to the internet? Yeah, that's what we all do, right? That whatever happened, we just don't know. And what I want to say, there was a dream of the internet. We failed in that dream. I'm also asking people to move on in, on to the next one. Ooh. There used to be a promise of the net. This one? Eh, no. This one. That promise has failed. This is what we wanted. This is what we got. Internet, which was supposed to be this interconnection, a social condition, where people with very little ingenuity were supposed to be able to make businesses out of nothing. Internet, which was going to be these technical connections where everybody could reach everyone, that's what we were all aiming for. And as Max Sermon told me, basically what I'm saying is, we're fucked. And now, we are all exporting this clusterfuck everywhere. <laughs> Within a 10-year period, we rapidly turned the world's telecommunications network into behavior collection platforms. And that behavior collection was supercharged by advertising sales. You all know that we are trick ponies, right? We behave for the machine, the internet, and that we are given things. Then the experience of being given those things is captured, surveilled, and surveyed and then we are given more things in return of that feedback. And that's the way it works. 
So instead of becoming self-governing citizens, we are becoming behavior creators, content creators for the net, which is measuring us all the time. Over here, we behave for the Chinese Communist Party. That will have, let us have the smoothest life in the internet as they ensure that they are first in the race in turning all of the Black Mirror episodes into reality. Good show, UK. What is your favorite episode? Um, we can talk about that later. Um, but over here, as I said, we behave for the Chinese Communist Party. And over here, we behave for Facebook. Now, we think that Facebook is going to let us have this smooth ride, whatever is the life it will offer us, and Communist Party will let us live in the net in this way. All in all, an anti-humanist idea. Our choice is between behaving for the advertisers or behaving for the Communist Party. We may feel we are being given a choice, but in truth, the choice has been removed. Facebook wants to make money. Party wants to make power. But in the end, you, we, human beings, the self-governing, self-learning, self-equilibrating human being has ceased to exist in both places. The conference is about health of the network. The health of the network is threatened by tying advertising platforms to the political economy of connection. It's now so profitable for the platform companies to watch you watch, perform for the internet, that they're willing to pay to move packets for everybody. That was the big charitable idea of free basics by Facebook. Then this fun stuff happens. This net, which we currently have, it has defeated one of our greatest social hopes, which was that making everything more open and connected would begin to undermine the primary sources of injustice in the human race. Ignorance, misogyny, etc., all of that was supposed to disappear. Remember, internet, the great leveler, internet which is going to bring women empowerment, internet which is going to educate every brain on earth? Eh, whatever happened to that? So what has happened is that this, we thought human injustices, ignorance, misogyny, etc., were going to come down because we were going to learn and all these great things were going to happen. What has actually happened in the net is that it has reinforced those injustices rather than attacking them. This is a regular affair on our greatest platform right now. Individuals these days are drawn into these digital environments because they are increasingly felt as necessary to ordinary social existence. There used to be a time when we wanted to ask each other, so what's your weekend plan? Now we want to ask, so which interesting place are you going to be staring your phone at from next weekend? Now individuals, because what happens is, because they think that's the way we want to exist, when they get into the digital environment, they find themselves treated as objects in the social theater of aggression and denigration. They often find themselves at the receiving end of sustained abuse, threats, debasement, either on their actual or perceived characteristics. Pick up any ground, it doesn't matter. Now, or over the expression of their particular ideas and convictions that are at odds with each other. Democracy. It's no longer pretty crazy to see the chaos it wrecks 
with our political system, where it is the internet. In India, trade associations, of which Facebook was a part in 2014, were proclaiming that 160 seats in the general elections will be impacted by social media. Nobody paid attention. India is only 1.25 billion people, small country, somewhere. Allegedly, the most reliable democracy in the world was completely subverted in a way that only Facebook and Twitter could have made possible. If you're reading the news these days, special counsel Robert Mueller's team of prosecutors are investigating how Russia manipulated social media to post propaganda. Facebook just turned over information to congressional investigators showing that it sold about $100,000 worth of ads to a pro-Kremlin Russian propaganda company seeking to target US voters. That's a relatively small ad spend, right? It's only $100,000, but one that could have reached 70 million Facebook users. Now, without this advertising platform stuff, who actually believes that the British people could have been convinced that 350 million pounds was going to the European Union every week. You put it at the side of the red bus and everyone knows eh, it's a lie. But if you put it up on thousands of Facebook pages, in addition to putting it on the red bus, then people think if there must be some fire, if there's so much smoke around there, the gullibility of the human race is increasing. Our gullibility is increasing. And why is it increasing? Because the most important business on earth is now gulling people. Learn more and more about us so that you can gull them effectively. And that's what is happening. Now the opinion climate, that is the Twitter machine, is a little different. Not because in the end it's not about advertising, because it's always about advertising. But in the end, the government's hand is a little heavier, heavier where Twitter is concerned, because there is moment-to-moment -moment control of the climate of opinion. Now, this moment-to-moment -moment climate of, uh, of control of opinion draws politics to it more straightforwardly. And the rise of the troll armies around the world is a sign of that. How does the US government presently control the news cycle? It has this one big internet troll with 41 million people. It controls the news cycle in only one way, chaos. That's how it controls. One tweet goes out. You do not know that the perk of becoming a president is you can get to watch TV for six hours, right? but that is also the perk. But when somebody watches television, a tweet goes out, everybody else reacts, then we all behave, then the platform loves it. Because the more you talk, the more you behave, the better it is for the platform. The more you are watched doing what you are doing that time. Elsewhere in the world, governments control the news cycle, not with one big troll, but armies of trolls, the small ones, and also censors. We already talked about the Chinese. So this, this is Ravish Kumar. He's a very prominent Indian journalist. He has a huge fan following, um, something of a size of many countries in the European Union, but obviously you don't know about him. He, his prime time daily show is not in English. It's in Hindi, which is the largest language in India right now. Um, so on September 29th of this year, he wrote a letter to the prime minister of the largest democracy in the world. The letter is titled, Is My Life in Danger? This is after a prominent editor has been shot outside her house in Bangalore on September 5th. What has this to do with internet? It has got nothing to do with internet, but with social media, it has got everything. I'm gonna just quote a little bit of what he wrote in that letter. 
He says, since I have read on altnews.in in the morning that few people on Twitter who are abusing me badly, threatening me, talking communally, claiming that a few other journalists and I, who are highly patriotic, are terrorists on a WhatsApp group named XYZ, I'm really frightened. He says, Mr. Prime Minister, if I read the derogatory language used in this WhatsApp group about me and other journalists, many people will close their ears. The language used about women journalism is really shameful. Why am I telling you this story? All I'm giving you is a little bit of an example of how now politics uses these tools which we think are just for our communication. What happens from the point of view of states is that they think we, there is a climate of opinion. We add to the climate of opinion something over here and we subtract from the climate of opinion something over here by censoring. And by, with our own troll armies, we add something here. And then the result is what we want. When we can't get what we want and the chaos reckons us, then we just shut the internet down. See, that's the reason. When I talk about internet shutdowns, we have governments actually turning the net off and on and holding hostage everybody's economy, learning, and daily lives for their concerns with public order or national security. There is an overbalancing which is going on right now in the direction of having curfew all the time. There were 55 shutdowns in India in 2017, 61 in the world in total in this year. We're not over, the year isn't over yet. 25 times internet was killed in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. For three months, from June 18th to September 18th, in the eastern part of the country, in Darjeeling, it was totally covered in darkness. There was no internet at all. Now, a businessman said that time that many a people in that area had bought things on loans and installments. And due to the internet shutdowns, they had not been able to use net banking and failed to make the payments on time. The banks were closed and online transactions could not be facilitated. Like high school students who wanted to apply to universities could not apply and fill up their forms because there's no internet. Internet shutdown had also severely disturbed other lives. A businessman said that I'm the sole breadwinner of my family and my entire business has collapsed because I'm majorly dependent on online transactions that I make or receive. But in the past 60 days, I haven't been able to do that and the entire family is suffering. These are real stories, these are real people. They don't live in the same places as metropolitan cities, etc. but this is a reality which is happening nowadays. Internet gets shut down and there are initiatives like Digital India or everybody, the next two billion, three billion, everybody comes online and then the government pulls the switch whenever it feels like. Both of things seem like a little cross-purpose at each other, right? You want to bring everybody online, but you also want to shut it down as, a, as and when you feel like. What really gives here? And this what happens. The reaction in democratic countries is also that we've wrecked it all up. We don't have a good example. Why don't we actually follow the example of complete total control? Now, health of the internet, this is what the conference is about, right? The concentration of hatred and aggression. So is it going up or going down? Let's have just a very simple measure. If the health, if the internet is really healthy, then aggression and hatred should be going down. Who here wishes to claim it otherwise? You think it's going up? You think it's going down? Don't worry, I'm not going to grade you on this. But why did, the, why did this all happen? Why did we land up here? Mostly because we love the shruggy, right? Somebody says all this, oh, stop 
playing all this dystopian stuff. I don't like it. You pray, you're raining on my parade. I'm here to have a good conference. Just put it on the side. And of course, it's so convenient. And then we go, eh, whatever. Then we move on. Our lives are busy. We have to do other things. We did not take any of the measures that we should have to reduce the ability of the states and the market to push us all around. We didn't protect anonymity. We threw people's identities into a cauldron. We put people out there. We told children, live your lives in this network. Then we exposed them to rape, murder, threats, and bullying, and all other ways. And then we called it free speech. As though we had suddenly abandoned all the Jeffersonian or Gandhian ideas and hopes that an educated population would be more capable of self-governance, that we only needed information and no real knowledge about any of this. Who in this room, who in this room wishes to stand up now and say that the current internet is increasing the human capacity for self-governance? Who? You want to say that the president of the United States is a better president because of tweeting? You want to stand up and now and say that Facebook is improving democracy around the world? Who here actually believes that any of this enormous promise of technology is being realized? The potential of technology to change our world remains immense. The only limitations being our over-dependence on the current advertising-based political economy and belief that we have no control over any of this. And our dear Shruggy, whatever, I have to move on with my life. So here are a few thoughts. You can dismiss them. This is a talk. It's going to end very soon. You can move on. Or you can pay a little bit more attention. What I'm asking for is a little bit of quiet. Remember there used to be libraries? and places where we actually just read and thought and processed information which we learned. But now there is a device which is constantly demanding my attention. It beeps and bleeps and then tells me, talk to me, talk to me. This person is asking for your attention. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, why aren't you talking to me? It's been so long. 2,600 times is how many times we touch our smartphones every single day. What I'm asking is I need a little bit of quiet. Not these machines which are constantly demanding our attention. What we need are companies that are not advertising platforms to make browsers, the basic tech of the net. We need more federated services and fewer centralized services to conduct our online social lives. We need to pay up and stop eating the cheese on the mousetrap. We need to dissociate the social sharing amongst groups of people who wish to retain their autonomy and privacy from advertising platforms. We need to recognize that we were not building media for advertising to Jew haters. Somebody else did that. In fact, two Jews did that. We need freedom from intolerable efforts to take over our minds, whether that consists of misogynist harassment or clutter of active advertising. What we need, again, is the rights and freedoms of the users. And above all, more of cute videos. There's evidence to back this up. What is happiness? Can we find it in a new pair of shoes, a fast car, or a bigger house? Or does real happiness lie somewhere else? Hundreds of studies have proved that spending time in nature can make us feel better both in mind and body in a way that nothing else can. We wanted to find out whether simply watching footage of the natural world could have the same effect. 
Last year, we partnered with Professor Daka Keltner, an expert in human psychology and emotion at the University of California, Berkeley. For this project, he has reviewed over 150 scientific studies that explore the positive effect of nature on humans. We also asked over 7,500 people in six countries to tell us how they were feeling before and after watching Planet Earth 2 clips. This data showed significant increases in joy, contentment, curiosity, awe, amazement, and wonder, and clear reductions in tiredness and low energy. It even reduced stress, especially among younger viewers. These findings revealed that wildlife programs can cause viewers to experience positive emotions. My study of human happiness has revealed that these emotions, amazement, wonder, and awe, are the foundations of a powerful form of real human happiness. Real happiness is a deeper, less transient form of happiness that can positively affect our health and well-being. So by simply watching incredible footage of our natural world, you too can experience these uplifting emotions, helping you to be more connected with this amazing place we call home. Just asking for all of this and nothing more. Thank you. Oh, another long question. Wow, that was great. What a great way to kick it off. Um, we have time for one question, so whoever has the most boring question, uh, then make yourself known. And don't be shy, because I, I know it's a Saturday morning. <laughs> OK, I'll let the microphone, person with the microphone pick. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your speech, very interesting. Uh, I want to ask you, is there any way of recovering or redeeming certain platforms like the steps that YouTube took with regards to removing advertising from a lot of like hateful video, or do you believe that we have to move to different services that are federated, or can these platforms be nudged into getting better in any way? I have been hoping that we could have nudged them into a direction where things would actually solve or move and give us a semblance that something was being done. That theater is being enacted pretty well. We always get a semblance that something is being done. New policies are enact enacted, something new comes up every day. We are doing this for hate speech, this for harassment. But honestly, I really want to understand that if the political economy of the net is going to be tied so close to advertising, then how far can you actually go? If each behavior of ours is going to feed into the machine and that gives them more information to sell us something, then how much are our expectations very realistic to say these minor little adjustments here and there are going to do something about it? I'm not asking for an abolishment, but I'm also asking for more reliance on federated services. I'm also saying that this, this thing which we've told people, it was only 10 years ago that we got the smartphone, but we've said that, oh, you, computing is really difficult. You can do it. Let us do it all for you, and we can give you these shiny things where you can just touch and do it. We can actually run the computers ourselves. So if, if the economy of the net is going to continue to be so closely tied with advertising, how realistic it is to expect minor changes to do what we expect it to do is a question which I'm putting it out to yourself. You didn't pay me, so I couldn't answer that question. That's how I actually answer questions. <laughs> Jokes aside, but I don't have easy answers. It's not a very easy um, solution for this, but I really want people to think about that that's the reality. We can have cognitive dissonance about it, but if that's where my money comes in, what prerogatives or what priorities do I have to reduce any of it? Why is it that Twitter and Facebook find it so difficult to take down content, to actually control or shut down one particular account? The world would be better off if that one particular account was shut down. <laughs> 
Why? Because that account generates so much behavior for the machine that it's worth everything. Okay. So let's, uh, let's give Mishi another round of applause for not being Thank the struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.